This is the Cyclist Tactics, no direct relation to football tactics and glory, and I've attempted to do a series on this twice before, but I think third time's the charm. I think we're finally ready to do a long-term save that accomplishes the goals that I have set out. But what exactly are those goals? Well, for this particular playthrough, my starter rider, Herman Watson, is going to try and win all five major tours in the Pro League. That's Grand Slam number one. Grand Slam number two concerns Vladislav Pavlov, one of the riders you can sign at the start of the game. Since he's got good potential too, his goal will be to try and win all five major classics in Pro League. But those dreams are in the distant future for now. Springvale Rollers starts out as a new team in the Amateur League and I'll admit I actually re-rolled this start of career once to get a schedule where I could compete in nine races in season one. You're not always guaranteed that because every other team ahead of you in the rankings gets to pick a race before you and you can get locked out of certain months. Of course, two riders does not a team make, so I'm also signing Perry Campbell and Ward for this season. I ideally would have liked the maximum six riders from the offset but your funding in Season 1 doesn't allow it, even if you set your expectations higher in exchange for a little more cash. As it turns out, I'm going to be over budget anyway, but the only penalty, as long as you're less than 10% over budget, is even higher expectations from the sponsors, which I believe we can easily achieve because more riders means more major fitness peaks, and fitness peaks are quite potent, as it gives even a low-level rider a chance to pull out a big result. The fitness peaks on the season planner are marked in green, with the bright green boxes being the major peaks. The red boxes are when riders are recovering, and thus it's ideal not to have them ride during those months. After a substantial amount of fiddling, this is the schedule I've arrived at, and we can finally start the season. As for the nature of the races we've signed up for, I'll go into them in more detail when we get to them, but we have a total of four tours and five one-day races to do. Elsewhere, the Desert Sprint is the first major race of the pro season, and given this is one of Pavlov's ultimate goals, it's clear that it'll have to be at least somewhat proficient in flat riding by the end. But given the nature of the other four monuments, it may be difficult to specialize him in flat specifically. Speaking of flat though, Bizarre Sprints is a flat tour that starts with a prologue. This is good for me as it will make it easier for me to explain the basic move mechanics. The goal is to get from one end of the stage to the other as fast as possible and the number on each tile designates how far you can move without spending energy subject to modifiers such as rider skill. Because Campbell is a flat specialist, he can ride a little bit further than most on the flat without using energy or attack. And if we do use it, we can actually reach the finish line within two turns. The other riders don't fare so well. But unfortunately, even Campbell doesn't because there are stronger riders still in this field. So let's see if we can fare better riding in a pack. As long as you're not the lead rider in a group, you gain slipstream for following a move, and in this case it was a fast opening move that gives us all 7 slipstream. The flat and downhill parts of a stage tend to keep everyone glued together, whilst it's the mountains that tend to create separation due to both a slipstream penalty and hard cap when travelling over that terrain. Speaking of separation, Watson's going to try and get the mountain jersey, but for whatever reason, the yellow jersey follows. Thankfully, Ramsey's not interested in out sprinting us for the mountain jersey, and we do claim the three points. And with no further difficulties on the stage, we can skip right ahead to the sprint preparation. Attack per turn is the most important stat for sprints, which is why Perry's sacrificing himself to protect Campbell and Pavlov here. At first I thought my positioning was a little bit too far back, but Perry can't actually reach the finish line, whilst Ramsey, now reconnected with the peloton and in the relay, can. This means we are instead too far forward in the sprint, and whilst we can use an attack point to get by Ramsey, and two more to add some velocity to help Pavlov, 
that's still not going to block much of anything and four more riders get past Pavlov, fifth place is not good enough to get points on a per stage basis. To be more precise, we did get green jersey points, but no prestige unless we finish top three on the stage. On the plus side, Herman Watson is wearing the red jersey on day three. With how tricky sprinting can be, however, it's probably easier to just break away from the pack and win that way. And today's stage, despite being listed as flat, gives everyone a chance to do that. The 12% section in the middle of this move limits maximum slipstream to one point, and that means that when some riders in the relay choose to attack to the 5 node instead of the 4, the peloton gets left behind. Most of the field, however, follows it rather than the peloton. Perry gets left behind, Watson can't actually follow the front group and will try to bridge across in group 2. No luck with that however, the next move from Makarov is so brutal that no one can follow it. A quintet including Pavlov end up in group 2, whilst Campbell can't even follow that and has to drop further back to pick up some help from Watson. Group 2 dynamics force Kuzman to do all of the chasing here if he wants to protect his overall lead in the race, meaning it's effectively a match race between him and Makarov to the line, which Makarov will ultimately win, whilst we can take advantage of this, follow him all the way, and get what I thought was going to be second, but Jonas Winter was able to add some velocity and we only had two attack points left over once we followed the final move. Campbell rolls through not too far behind, though he has lost some time. But more importantly, Pavlov has gained time on a lot of riders and moves well up in the general classification. If we can hold on to 4th overall, it would be worth 50 prestige points, which is twice that of a stage win or winning the mountain jersey, which we do unfortunately lose to Makarov on tiebreak. And this here is the last realistic chance for riders to gain or lose time on this tour. This year's Bizarra has been surprisingly bumpy for a race that's usually pancake flat. Nonetheless, two points of slipstream can be obtained here, and the field is able to follow it. So with us no longer having to worry about losing time, we can focus purely on the sprint, which is going to come out of P0, aka the relay. You see, P1 gets more slipstream than P0, but if there are too many riders in P0, the group behind can get boxed out of the sprint, and we need to battle for a wheel that's relatively close to the front, but not too close. If in doubt, it's usually a good idea to take the wheel of a relatively good sprinter who's well positioned themselves, as they tend to know what they're doing, and if you just follow their lead, you can get a decent enough result. Alexander Cook turned out to be too far back himself with Ethan Hall building up a lot of velocity beforehand, but Campbell was able to get around Cook for second, and then we were able to use Pavlov and Perry as blockers to increase the amount of effort riders behind Campbell had to put in if they wanted to get around. So that's a second place finish. And so we gained a total of 103 team points in this tour, which unfortunately gets reduced to 46 for sponsor purposes because it wasn't a objective for us. But all of our riders, except for Perry who doesn't need it, also get additional experience points for being successful on this tour. Herman Watson coming second in the mountain rating is still good for some prestige as well. We don't get any level ups, but those will come with time. In the meantime, we have to start building our shortlist for next season in order to sign more riders, and this is a two-step process. First, we scout. We pick an archetype and a nation. I've, for the purposes of this playthrough, I'm only going to scout in Gazmia because that's the country our team is based in. And then, once it returns the talents that you've scouted, you can either shortlist one of them, or you can shortlist anyone on the lower list, and you repeat this eight times throughout the season. Anyway, the second major classic on the pro calendar is also flat, but with a twist. Lots of cobblestones. And with there being a second cobble classic at the end of the season, naturally Pavlov is going to want to be good on the cobblestones if he wants to complete the Grand Slam. In the meantime, however, we have a time trial one-day race, Arrow of Timor. 
Tyler Campbell has his major fitness peak for this, which means he also gets additional speed, so hopefully a better performance than what he achieved at the Prologue and Bizarra. Now for these slightly longer time trials, it's better not to go as fast as possible from the offset, because if you do use your maximum attack on a move, your attack per turn reduces by one for the rest of the stage, so it's more prudent to save that max attack for the turn before the finish so you can get as close as possible because the closer you are to the finish line the better your fractional time is on the turn that you actually cross the finish line. But alas, even the major fitness peak in plus one and flat hasn't done much for Campbell here. This move is going to put him seventh on the road and given the proximity to the finish line that's where he'll stay. Our other three riders were really just making up the numbers. Perry almost got into the top 10, but didn't quite. So the 7th place finish is all of the prestige we get. Thankfully, prestige does pay out down to 10th when it comes to overall standings. So we get some points from this, but it really wasn't what I was hoping for. Back to scouting then. I wouldn't mind having a pure sprinter on the team, and that's who I'm scouting for, but... This trio isn't very good. I think it's time to pick someone from the lower list, and out of the options we have, Samuel Jenkins is probably the most well-rounded option. If you're wondering what some of those other numbers mean, uh, it hasn't really come up yet, but at the Weishorn, I'll have a good chance to explain how energy, or lack thereof, can affect the proceedings. Speaking of energy drainers, the Ferenia Masters. Surprisingly flat this year, a sprinter ends up taking it, but normally you have to be good going uphill to succeed here, and that is normally mutually exclusive with flat and cobble skills, so you can see why the Grand Slam may be difficult for Pavlov to accomplish. So here are our first true climbs of the playthrough, and it's an under-attended race. Herman Watson can definitely take advantage of this. He has his major fitness peak. I should point out that just because there are only 18 riders of note in this race, doesn't mean that the peloton is only 18 riders, period. The peloton is its own entity that consists of additional helper riders from each team, as well as probably a few wildcard club teams that are too weak to do anything notable in the race. So, mechanically speaking, the field is larger than the entry list suggests, and these additional riders become the peloton entity which has its own energy and attack values, and you can position yourself behind the blob to get more slipstream, but if you're in P2 or P3, you can't make a move that would overtake the peloton. You've got to reposition yourself back in P1, the group that can actually act first. And if you mistime it, you might find yourself in a situation where the race has left you behind, especially in amateur, where the peloton is relatively weak. And that is also why I had to follow that relay move that landed on the 7 rather than the 11, because falling behind the peloton means that the move you use to catch up to them, you end up in P3, and then it takes two more turns after that to overtake the peloton, because you can't overtake the peloton for a dropped group either. Anyway, the race is heating up, and we're going to have the numbers advantage in this group, which also means the burden of doing the pulling falls on us for now. Having more riders in the front group also allow me to shut down the early unwanted attacks. Perry here using his max move just before the climb to make sure that Watson didn't get caught out because he wasn't in the best position yet to follow an attack. And now it's down to our climber to try and bring it home. Herman Watson can indeed follow the winning move, but it's going to take his max attack per turn, leaving him pretty wrecked for the sprint. You see, even though we didn't run out of energy with him on this stage, he is still low, which has reduced his energy per turn. Thankfully, him having full recovery means he doesn't lose as much energy per turn as he would, even on low energy, which means he still has a 6-5, well, a 6-4 now, in him, for the last move. And because even a light mountain offers less slipstream than a flat, this has a minus two slipstream modifier, it's actually best for us to lead this from the front and challenge the other riders to sprint around us. 
Of course, there was no stopping Emil Fischer on the day. He was just too strong, but the other riders around us couldn't get past and Herman Watson takes a brilliant second place. David Perry was also able to come home in 7th place for an extra 40 ranking points, but most importantly, Watson gets 140 points, which fulfills the sponsor objective just 3 months into the season, gets him a level up, and also gets Pavlov a level up because he gets a bonus for being teammates with a successful rider. So at the start of the next episode, we have two level ups to get around to. See you then.